Hey, what's up? I'm Amin Dillon, and welcome to my podcast. I'm sitting down with the movers and shakers and the stars to chat about life, love, business, and being a total boss. It's raw, it's candid, it's the stories behind the headlines. This is In Conversation. We're good? Okay, Jazz Dummy, good to see you. Welcome back to Toronto. Thank you for having me, man. I need it closer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's redo that. Just have it nice and close because then I get the best audio. Okay. Okay, so Jazz Dummy. Yep. Good to see you. Welcome back. Good to see you after so many years. Yes, I love your memory. You remembered meeting me in 2013. Yes, at a banquet hall, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Good times at the banquet hall. But it was great because high heels, I just come out yeah. and you were riding that wave. So yeah, that was just an incredible time for you, right? Amazing time, man. Um, I'd say that that was the point where I got the international kind of recognition for mm-hmm. what I was doing. I mean, I was doing songs before that and there were massive hits for me in the UK, but... Mm. Um, I'd say in India and Canada and America, that's kind of a, what stamped me as, a, as an artist, international artist. Yeah. Is that when you were getting stopped? Like, is that when you'd be at the airport and people would be like, oh my God, you're from the song High Heels? Yeah. That still happens, <laughs> obviously. Oh, really? <laughs> is that the song that still people um, remember you for? You know, in, in, I think, some parts of India, yes. But a lot of the time, especially like places like Punjab and Delhi, it's songs like Zulfa and Be Parvanya and... The latest song now, Kaysal. Mm-hmm. Okay, very cool. So you have actually had such a long career. Like you're still so young. You're so yeah. young. But it seems like you've just basically grown up in this industry, right? Yeah. Like, Do you remember ever a time when you weren't in this industry? Like just a normal kid? Yeah, of course I do, man. <laughs> well, because I was reading your bio. At nine yeah. years old, you decided to do training. Yeah. At nine. Yeah, man, nine years old. You know what it was? Um like, cause my dad was part of a band, and he, there's mm-hmm. that whole culture in the UK was was massive. The whole band culture, so um, just growing up in that, I was all 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 around music. Mm-hmm. But um, I think uh, for me personally, uh, um, the journey really began when I was around about 15, 16, the, prop, the proper musical journey. Is that when you were in India? Yeah, trained? when, I, when I, I moved to India, yeah, when I was At 16. 16. 16, yeah. Wow. What about your education? Well, I did my education in the UK. I did my GCSE, which is like. Pro, um, secondary school. Okay. I don't know what you, ca- you guys call it. It's high school. High school, yeah. But I think you do high school until 18, 19 here, right? So you didn't get to go to prom. You didn't get to no, do the no, normal No, we don't do proms teenager. in the UK until like the, I think they started it like last five, six years. But yeah. we didn't have we didn't have any proms. You didn't get school. to go to the mall with your friends. I did. Like I went to the mall. <laughs> Come on, like sixteen. <laughs> like, I, had, I had a nice y- British life. You know what yeah. I mean? And even in India, it was nice. But but I think when I moved to India, that kind of like stamp me that i'm gonna start doing music like properly yeah so when you went to india though yeah. at such a young age what was that adjustment like oh uh, did you have some family that went with you or were you entirely on your own so i went to india with my dad um yeah. my baby was living my my grandmother was living in um in punjab in a bend in a village mm-hmm. what village um it's a village called sandra Sodhya. okay it's in a, in a district called Husharpur. Okay. If, you heard of it, if anyone knows, you yeah. know, shout out to them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, my, my grandma was living there and um, my dad went with me to set me up. He kind of, um, he's, he, got, he got me a car out there and he got me a driver to go to my lessons every mm-hmm. day. It was like a plan, like from the beginning, like since I was like nine years old, my dad, like, it was like he was just, he kept prodding with the same thing. Like the only way you're going to learn is if you go to India. The mm-hmm. only way you're going to have good Punjabi is if mm-hmm. you live in, live in India, good Hindi. Uh, only way you're going to have a good, f- a great foundation of Indian classical is if you actually go to India and learn there. So it was like every couple of weeks that I was reminded, I have to go to India, I have to go to India, mm-hmm. I have to go to India. And then boom, I ended up in India and I was 16, man, with my dad mm-hmm. for like three weeks. He set me up and then he went and left me there for a year, man. I was like, yo, dad, I don't want to stay here. It's I was going to ask man. you, after he leaves, that's when reality sits, even though yeah, you're your baby there. But that, you know what? I just want to say, man, that day when he left, man, I was 16 years old. Yeah. I didn't have any friends, just my grand, which I haven't spent a lot of time with. Mm-hmm. It was hard, man. It was so hard. It was so, like, I was so upset. I remember the day when he left. I did not want him to go, man. It was mm-hmm. so hard. But I just thought, you know what? I think the one thing that kept me going was, because my dad has such a massive passion for music, mm-hmm. And he didn't. He wasn't internationally successful. I thought, you know, what, I gotta do it for my dad. I, I've just gotta make this happen. So every day, I had a calendar in my room. Mm-hmm. Every day, like a countdown, because I bought my return ticket for the ne- the year 
uh, year after, mm -hmm. but in like in I think it was June or July. There's like a, I think 27th of July or something it was. <laughs> so basically, what happened was every day I'd mark off the day like when I'm gonna go back. That's so it, sad. Yeah, it was really sad, man. And the but days go so great. slow when you do oh, that. You're yeah. like, the day's not over yet. Yeah, but the beautiful thing was that it sh it taught me so much, man, about self discipline. Mm -hmm. It taught me so much about just just being. Um, dedicating to one, dedicated to one thing, and mm. working towards that one goal. So I just thought, you know what, I'm here now. After about two, three weeks of being sad, and doing my lessons, I thought, you know, what, I'm here now, and Dad's not gonna come back here mm. until. Well, I'm gonna see him in England now, so I've just gotta work hard. So every day I was just literally eight, nine hours, ten hours a day of just practice singing yeah. every day, man. That's what it was. I just want to remind people, this is like a time before social media, before yeah. WhatsApp calls. It was like, if you wanted to be connected, you got to do the old fashioned dialing, dialing yeah. get a calling card. Luckily, yeah, in my village, we had a phone in the house, um, but we couldn't make international calls from that from that phone. Mm -hmm. So I could only call my parents, yeah, if, it, well, I couldn't speak to my parents if they call me, or there was an STD around then. It's yeah. like a, it's basically a, f a phone booth. It's called a mm -hmm. STD is a phone I booth. I remember them. <laughs> no, it's actually transmitted. <laughs> Whenever we'd call someone to like send us clothing, you'd have to be like, did they call us from there? And they yeah. would do the missed call too. Yeah, exactly. So every Sunday I was, I was allowed to go to the local village, local town of the village, um, which is a place called Nandachor. And I'd have like a like a fifteen minute conversation with my mom and dad. Yeah, that would be the day, like the, the best day of the week for me. That so, sucks. You yeah. literally weren't talking to any of your friends N or no, man. I, I was just completely like, like, just c disconnected. Yeah, yeah, disconnected from the whole world. Like, even I, I didn't have a phone obviously around then, so I was just like, you know what, I've just got to make this happen. So I was just working, but it was beautiful, man. Like now looking back at it, it was it was it was wicked because it gave me so much focus like now obviously when i sit down to practice i've got my phone next to me mm -hmm. then it, i had no phone next to me i had no one bugging me no one saying I've, you gotta do this you gotta do that it was just boom just the concentration was on my work i just mm -hmm. i've got to do this particular exercise this rug just gotta go in so it was just work 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 mm -hmm. and i learned so much then man i learned in terms of music in terms of living um with nothing basically because yeah. living in a village is hard man like mm -hmm. as as the year went on it got really hot man so did you have consistent electricity that's the thing <laughs> isn't it? i remember those days that's actually the they thing. still have those days in the like, wind it would be like 35 40 degrees up to 45 degrees and we'll have a cut like an electric cut for three days mm -hmm. and i'll be i'll be trying to ring the 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 the, the, f the phone exchange but you when is the when is the phone going to be disconnected because you uh, connected you'll be like oh, i'll be connected in the next next two hours or or i'll be connected tomorrow so and so day and then in the, living in the village everyone's like Baji, the, 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 the visually ain't gonna come back until like the uh, next week. I'm like, oh my God, man, it's 45 degrees yeah. here. And I'm burning, I'm like, what are we gonna do? But then literally, like, it was just, I thought, I have to do it, I'm mm -hmm. gonna have to live here. So to the point where I didn't sleep, <laughs> I had to, there's this thing there's called- There's no way you can. Like, yeah, just like making sure my t-shirt's like completely wet and putting it on and thinking, you know what, this will cool me down for mm -hmm. the next couple of hours or an hour at least. Does that work? It worked for a bit. Okay. But it was hard, man, but it was beautiful as well. Yeah, that's why I really wanted to bring that up because I can't imagine someone else around that age mm. deciding to leave living in a first world with every sort of luxury Amenity, possible, yeah. things yeah. that we take for granted, like TV or being able to drive down and or have electricity, yeah. and then choosing to live in, basically in a bend yeah. and have all those luxuries taken away, yeah. be away from your friends and family, yeah. and be so dedicated at such a young age. You know, I think it Good was for just... You. Yeah, thank you, man. It was just, I think the whole... Because my dad had such a massive passion, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was like I wanted to do it for him, but then without even realizing, it, I really wanted to do it for myself as well. Mm -hmm. Like, it, and now I look back at it and I think, you know what? At that point, I was thinking, what am I doing here? I said, look, I said, look up at the stars and I think, what the hell am I doing here? I'm from England. I've got a British passport. I've got an amazing life there. I've got great friends. I've got my mom and dad and my brother and sister living there. What am I doing here? Like, I need to go back. But then I thought, yo, but this is like just to become some become successful you have to sacrifice things i've been hearing that for years mm -hmm. when i was younger as well to become successful and to become great at something you have to sacrifice something and that mm -hmm. was my sacrifice then man. and you know what and I, I if i had a chance to do it again i'd do it again wow simply because that's what made me 
into the artist I am today, man. Well, especially with the discipline. You learned it at such a young age. Yeah. yeah it kept with you. Yeah. While you were there, though, let me ask you, did you know the plan was, I'm going to actually make it, though? Because it's one thing no. to be trained, but then you don't actually know if you're going to make a career out of it. No, I didn't know, like, to be honest. Did your dad know? Because uh, he seems to, like, have the master plan, or he knows. He had the master plan, and, and it was it was amazing. But um, I think the one thing that's not, not certain is, is success. Like, you can't you can't be 100% sure that you're going to be successful. You can work towards something, but that's for the people to decide and the the universe and the energy of the universe to decide if you're going to be successful and if it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, even though I was practicing, I didn't know what was going to happen because I was, I mean, I was at school mm -hmm. um, before even going to India, I was school, at school. I wasn't great at school. I was just great at music. That was my thing. So when I came out of sc school, my education, the grades I got wasn't, weren't good enough to do a music A level mm -hmm. as well. Music A level is basically the next part you do to, to after schooling, after high school, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know what you have in, in, in Canada, but mm -hmm. that's how it is in the UK. And after that, you go to university to do that particular course. But so after all my schooling um, and going to India and returning back to England, I wasn't sure if I was going to do music, man, and, and really? as a profession, because even though I had, I had all this um, great knowledge of Indian classical music, there wasn't really an appetite for it in, mm. in the UK in terms of like there wasn't further education in that and it was hard to get into probably colleges and, and universities at a later stage with that qualification. But then, luckily, um, what happened was, I remember around the first year of college, um, uh, after about four months of college, I was doing an IT course mm -hmm. and it was... Oh, I remember you mentioned this IT, yeah. and it was like the worst thing ever for oh, you, it right? It was horrible. It was like sorry if anyone's in IT, <laughs> but it wasn't for jazz. It wasn't for me. Yeah, it just wasn't. And that kind of, um, I was just doing the course. I thought, you know what? I'll do this. It's called GMBQ. It's mm -hmm. like it's so rubbish. It <laughs> enables you to kind of like go into it further education to university, and it gives you enough, enough grades to get into university. Because I wanted to go to university, even if it was just doing a degree in IT. I would have done a degree in IT seriously. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it, but thought I've got to do something so I after about four months every Wednesday we had like an enrichment class which where we could do like table tennis badminton um whatever anything you wanted football whatever so there was a there was a guy in my, my security guy in my uni, in my college he was basically uh, a music producer I told you about this right mm. and um and he was like um every every week I'll be making beats whatever and I was like you know what I heard you make beats, man. So I really want to do like music production. So why don't we just like, wh why don't we just get in one day and just, mm -hmm. just make something happen? And he was like, um, he's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. And around that time, Garage was a massive thing. Like UK Garage music was massive. So he was on the UK Garage beats. I was like, yo, I want, I want to learn how to p program these beats and whatnot. It was just like Garage, UK Garage, like mm -hmm. dance music. So started making that. And, uh, and then roughly around the same time, in a weird way, like, um, one of my, my brother-in-law, his, his cousin was at a university called LIPA. It's the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. It's basically a, um, an institute that's set up by Paul McCartney from the Beatles. And basically, um, it's, they, have like 30, they have like students from around the world there. It's like really difficult to get in. And he was part of that, like the first Asian to be part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was like, yo, you should try and get in. And I'm like, I'm not going to get in, bro. Come on, man. I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a classical singer, but... Like, I don't think that's going to be of, of value to the university. And he was like, you know what? I think you should apply for the popular music and sound tech course. So, all right, cool, man. So I applied for it. Um, I had to do an audition. But instead of me physically going in, I sent him two demos of my recordings, like a classical recording of a rag I did. And um, uh, the garage beat I made with Mark, Marcus, his name was, sorry, um, sent that. Pff, got unconditional effort, man. And that's was, amazing. Was what was crazy was that when I turned up, I didn't know this. I was in the um, the theatre, and um, where, where the, all the students were kind of sitting, and it's like the introduction week, and they were like the popular music and sound technology course. Um, we've cho we've chosen thirty students from around the world. So wow, thirty. Yeah, yeah, thirty students from around the world, wow. and they have thousands of appli ap ap applicants, like well, applying for the course. So I somehow got in. I was thinking, you know what? There must be some sort of mistake here. Yeah. Like, how am I here, man? Like how am, how am I doing this? And for the first week, it took me like it took me a while for it to actually sink in. Mm -hmm. But then, boom, man, just did the course. And that, I was saying, I always say this, man, that moment of me going to that university changed my life. Mm -hmm. It changed the whole direction of my career. It changed the whole direction of 
of who I was going to be in terms of a music artist. I love that. What do you think would have happened, though, if you hadn't been accepted, if you hadn't even tried? Where do you think you'd be? Did you have a backup plan? Yeah, well, I was, because I did my degree in Indian classical music, that was my plan, to become a music teacher. I was okay. I was learning the piano. I was grade five, and it was eight grades. I was grade five on piano. And I thought, I'm going to do my eight grades. I'm going to do my eight grades on piano. And I'm going to do, um, I've got my degree in classical music. I'm just going to start teaching. Mm -hmm. And then, to be honest, after my university, I actually did that. Anyway, I was teaching. Before I even came into the industry, I was teaching music at home. So it was it was always going to be music. Yeah. It's just either I become a music uh, artist, as in performing artist, or I'm going to become a music teacher. Yeah. It was like the plan for my, my dad set it all up. He says, look, if you're not successful as a musician, at least you can go and teach. Mm -hmm. So he's like, mm, and that's sense. probably where he failed. Mm -hmm. um, um, he, he didn't learn music. Um, he started learning music really late. And it was he felt um, then he had us and it kind of became too late for him. He said, but um, um, I think that's probably what was he installed in me. He goes, mm -hmm. look, make sure you have your degree in in your in your classical music and in your in your music production, so you can be in a position where you can go out and teach. And that's exactly what I did. So it sounds like your dad has a huge role in shaping mm. your career, right? Of course, like I, I wouldn't be the artist I am if, if my dad didn't yeah. help me do that mm -hmm. what he did because he sacrificed everything man like my dad's a cabbie he's a cab driver and and he worked his butt off man mm -hmm. to make sure them fees were paid like I remember when, when I got a when I got a role when I got my position at Paul McCartney School of Music like it was a private funded university so the fees were so high like how high do you remember it was like around then it was like seven eight thousand mm pounds -hmm. a year a year. And that's oh. a lot of money, man. Mm -hmm. For a, like, he's probably earning probably ten thousand, eleven thousand pounds a year. Wow! And you know that's a lot of his money just lot. going, man. Like, mm -hmm. And he was a cab driver. He was just doing sixteen-hour shifts, man. So like, I can't, I can't even say like I wouldn't, I wouldn't. That moment, I could have changed my life. So, and that was, and I got into that university because of my dad. Because my dad said, look, it's gonna be hard, but you don't have to worry about it. You just have to do your work. Just work hard. Just make sure you don't fail. And I didn't fail. <laughs> Did you ever ask your dad why he was so insistent on believing in your dream? Like, you know, I'm sure parents that are watching hear yeah. their kids say a bunch of different dreams, right? But your dad seemed to really believe that you could make this in music. You Did know you what? I'll tell you what. I've, I've never asked him that question, but I know the answer for it because why? Why, why, why he would? Why he would say? My dad was like, he was a like. Um, he's born. He's born and and kind of brought up in in India, mm -hmm. but he came over to England when he was like nine years old. And um, so he's, he's quite a Brit. He's quite a, a Brit. Like mm -hmm. I would say he's more of a Brit than a than a than an Indian. Mm -hmm. I would say. So when he came to England, um, I think growing up he didn't get the opportunities that that someone like we've had and a lot of people kids now have, right? Mm -hmm. So he was like, you know, what? I want to make sure that that all th all three of my kids do something they actually love. Mm -hmm. And and that's what it was. He goes, he, he his message is always. It still is. Just do something you love. You have to do something that you love. If you don't love what you do, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hate yourself and hate your life. That's what it was, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what that's exactly what I I, f I say now. Like you have to follow your heart. Mm -hmm. If you don't follow your heart, you're not gonna you're not gonna be happy. Like my dad was a, um, a cab driver, and he was gigging, doing gigs as well, music as well, and he was he hated his his actual job funded his hobby, mm -hmm. and he hated his job. Mm -hmm. He hated it. He hated going out in cabin. He hated working in factories, but he knew he had to do it to provide for us. Mm -hmm. But um, but um, he s with he set up a dream, his own dream through me. So I love that beautiful man. He must be so proud of you. Like he must just watch yeah. you every day and kind of pinch himself and go like, "Wow, look at my son! Like carrying on my legacy, going further than I could have gone." He definitely is proud, but you know, Punjabi parents, they don't like telling their kids, man, that they're proud. Oh, he doesn't say <laughs> He doesn't brag he about you? He's never said to me, I'm really proud of you. He's never said that, but yeah. it's fine. I know he's happy, and I know he's he's happy that I'm, I'm making a career out of this. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I just want to say one thing, though. You guys, if your parents out there, you have to tell your kids that you're proud of them, man. Because you know what? Sometimes you f you, you seek that validation, and mm -hmm. if um, as as um, Punjabi parents don't really... D Punjabi parents don't really do that, mm -hmm. but I think they should. I think South Asian parents should do that. Not only Punjabi parents, mm -hmm. every South Asian in the world should encourage their kids to, to and say, I'm proud of you, man. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with that. So what is it like then being away from your family? Because oh, right. it sounds like you're very close, right? Yeah. Are you still living in Birmingham? 
No, I'm living in Chandigarh now. Oh, oh so okay, so you're, that's home for you now. Yeah, home now for me is is, is India Punjab wow. right now. So you actually really don't get to go home that often. Yeah, I, well, that's luckily cool. this year has been good because I've been going on maybe like every six, seven weeks. Oh, yeah, oh spending yeah, that's really a week good. with them, going back, and yeah. they they came to India as well. But it's difficult, man. Like I'm always on the road, like, mm-hmm. um, and there's a lot. Obviously, this life is like it demands a. L- the more you put in like anything the more you put in the better it kind of gets mm-hmm. and, and the harder it gets as well so um it is difficult but i kind of somehow i'm, I'm, I'm managing it yeah and it's working out yeah because i always say like being in this industry you have to touring is huge for you of course because now music is online you know your yeah. the sales have gone down people aren't buying albums anymore it's all yeah. downloading so i've heard where you're making your money is the shows right um well shows and streaming and there's so many avenues now right Mm -hmm. like i think in around 2009 2010 sales went completely dead in terms of uh, record sales Mm -hmm. and they are dead as well but there's so many other ways of making money for artists Mm -hmm. there's places like streaming apps like spotify uh, apple music um shows um, youtube music youtube there's so many different like ringtones um ringtones corner (laughs) tunes in india Mm -hmm. Um, there's PPL, there's PRS. There's oh wow! So, there's so many avenues yeah. you can make actually make money. It's just you got to be aware of it. And mm-hmm. I think that's one thing I, I I kind of put out there as much as I can. If you're an artist, that you have to understand music business, man. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just want to say that understanding um, making music is one element of of something, but having the knowledge of music business is is really important because you can be the artist where you sign over everything and you don't make anything mm-hmm. and be broke in the next 20, 30 years after yeah. your career. Maybe if your career is in us popping, then um, you'll be broke, like someone like R. Kelly, for example, mm-hmm. right? So I think music law, understanding the, the basics of PRS, PPL, VPL, um, uh, royalties, breakdowns, it's really important. I think if you're an artist, a, a new artist, you should understand that before you come in. Absolutely. Uh, let's get back to the music now. Yeah. So. <laughs> I always think like Bollywood, you know, yeah. everyone always goes Bollywood is like the dream, right? It doesn't mm. matter if you're an actor or a singer because mm. it's just they have such a huge audience. So, you know, yeah. if you have something to do with a Bollywood film, it's kind of like you've made it right. Mm. So for you, was that did you see that as well? Or were you like not interested in being in the film scene? You know what? I did see that because my whole thing was um, becoming a playback singer for Bollywood. Mm-hmm. And, like, I wanted to become sing for Bollywood films. But I'd say that that dream didn't shatter, but it kind of, I don't believe in it anymore. It's Why is w- that? It's weird. Because I think there was, at one point, um, Bollywood was making some amazing some amazing music, right? Mm-hmm. Number one. Number two, they were making original content, yeah? And number three, there wasn't favoritism. Mm-hmm. As, as much favoritism, I think. Um, and I think independent Punjabi music wasn't big as well around then like 15 years ago I'm speaking about. But now, like, independent music is so huge, especially Punjabi music. Like, Punjabi music in India is is the number one independent music, is is the number one in independent music in, in India. I'd say it is for South Asia in the world because it's, you can make a successful career out of it by doing it. Um, but I think the one thing um, that kind of shattered my, them, that Bollywood dream was, when I went to live in Mumbai for three, I lived there for three years. I mean, I did a, I did two songs for Bollywood. I did a song called Humne Pira Kiya with Neha Kakkar and I did a song called Hai Hinsa Natchi as well, which was super successful. But I I came, like, whilst I was living there and making music, I just felt like it was crushing my soul, man. Like, I, I wasn't making music that I really enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't in an environment where I felt inspired. Um, and that's simply because there's restrictions like you know it's and it's, it is some people can do that i can't do that physically because i'm not that type of artist i can't be given a brief and say you know what, make your song on this brief i can't do that uh, i can't make a song just for the sake of it i have to feel something and i think that's what bollywood is um it's all situational based or you make songs and make demos and you present them and I'm not giving someone my demo and then changing it for them. I'm not doing that. Mm-hmm. Like I'm making a song because I am 100% confident that song's going to work. If they take it, cool. If they don't, mm-hmm. I'll do it myself. Like th- That's how I feel, seriously, mm-hmm. man. So for me now, my focus has completely shifted. 
Like it's completely independent Punjabi music. And it was then as well. I mean, I launched myself as a Punjabi singer because I'm Punjabi and because I love Punjabi music as well. But um, what I'm trying to say is if Bollywood want my songs, I I'll give them, but mm -hmm. I don't want to change them. Yeah. Like, that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, actually, I'm glad you brought the Punjabi language because obviously your English is amazing. So yeah. I know you could sing English songs all you wanted, right? Yeah. But you've chosen still to remain in the Punjabi yeah. language industry. So why is that? You know, just I want to rep, man. Like, I w I will say like that Punjabi is I'm such a proud Punjabi man mm -hmm. inside and you know what I feel like I want to fly the flag for Punjabis worldwide and mm -hmm. like and I, I and I keep saying this and it's gonna ha I know it's gonna happen it's like J Balvin uh, in in the Latin scene he's smacking it mm -hmm. he's killing the scene he's he's representing his people and I want to be that person for the Punjabi people man and internationally in the mainstream even as well where I'm I'm representing Punjabi language in the mainstream i want to be the next i want to be the j balvin of, of the punjabi vibe you know, mm -hmm. you know what i'm trying to say yeah basically the punjabi j balvin <laughs> do you think we're remotely close to hearing on mainstream radio songs that are a little bit mixed like with english and punjabi or do you think we still have a long road i think it's possible man it's just no one revisited it like monday at the bachke yeah right? that song is always played and i'm like, like there's so other songs <laughs> but it's just no one v revisited that that territory no one's made vibes on that kind of vibe mm -hmm. um but i think it's definitely it's definitely possible to do it's just no one's making that kind of music and confident enough to do it that's all it is maybe we're waiting for you yeah maybe man <laughs> <laughs> is that something you're interested in like uh, collaborating with english artists and kind of yeah, doing that mix of course i mean I'm I'm happy to sing parts in English. I mean, um, but Punjabi is is, is always going to be the first first language, man. I'm going to sing in. Like I'm like I've, I've done a couple of collaborations. I'm working on with some mainstream artists as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, but um, I think I want to keep it 100 for for my people, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. You know what I really like about you, and I really um it reinforced it for me this weekend is you're very honest and candid. Like you know, there's a lot of people that try to separate their private and personal life, like not give their opinions, just kind of always have a happy face on, right? Yeah. But you have been very real, especially with taking a break. Because yeah. I remember thinking like, oh, I haven't really heard anything from him. And yeah. like, I was wondering what had happened. Yeah. But then like, obviously I'm not in a position to like, you know, yeah. WhatsApp you and be like, hey yeah. man, what's <laughs> going on, right? Um, so, but you came back and now yeah. have been very honest with your fans saying like, hey, you know, I've been struggling with music and the creative direction I was going yeah. in. So. Yeah was that just something natural for you the great thing with high heels is that stamped me as an international artist right mm -hmm. and i think everything that's come out after that it's kind of it's 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 shown my versatility mm -hmm. which is what i wanted to do like, i wanted to make music that people understand that i'm not just a one one hit wonder i, d I can't just make one style of music i want to make music that's that that's different and shows my personality and that's mm -hmm. what music is right so it's, it's 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 showing your personality and uh, going back to what you're saying about keeping it real like i think we have to keep it real man like if if you're in an industry where there's inspiring people that want to inspire to be like you or be an artist like they have to understand the logistics they have to understand the business they have to understand what goes on in the scene because if they don't they're going to struggle like i struggled probably 15 years ago like i remember obviously it's a lot different now because we've got platforms like youtube and mm -hmm. and spotify and all the other platforms but and play things like Instagram, social media to connect with people. I remember when I first started about 10 years ago, um, when I was living in, uh, before I even started my career in, in making music, like I used to meet songwriters, music producers all the time, but I well, try and meet them, but no one even took me seriously because there was, and it was so hard to, to reach out to people because mm -hmm. we didn't have them platforms. Like, yeah. like now Instagram's just one text away, right? You DM them. And exactly. Done, yeah. You couldn't do that. You had to physically meet them. So I met so I used to turn up at people's houses. Yeah. Songwriters say, wow. Baji, I'm a singer and I sing like this. I used to take my harmonium to the house, sit with them and say, look, this is how I sing. Please give me a song. That's how it used to be like, and, and how's the reaction? Were they welcoming for that? Now, or were some they of like, the, get off my property? So <laughs> some of them, right. Some of the writers were like, yeah, mate, here's, here's my book. Just just take what you want. Like, and that, for me, was like heartbreaking. And these yeah. are big writers in Punjab, like big writers that have done some legendary songs. And it just, things like that broke my heart. But I thought, you know what, it's all right. It's fine. Like, I'm, I'm going to come back from this and I'll make something successful off my own back. But a lot of a lot of the, the music producers and singers, uh, music producers and writers, they, they respected that, that hustle that I was physically carrying 
carrying a harmonium at every single place I went to. So, so um, I think the hustle is really important, man. That is a hustle because yeah, not man. many people can deal with rejection or putting yeah. themselves out there. So, how has the hustle changed then? So that was the hustle then. about ten years ago. For artists that are entering now or even right now for you, hmm. how has the hustle changed? Well, I just want to just want to go back onto what, how it is now. Like obviously now it's it's you can use platforms like social media, mm -hmm. yeah, right? To put yourself out there and, and people can see what you're doing like that. But the hustle for um so it's a little easier now. It wasn't that easy I then. Agree. But the hustle for me has it changed? Um I'd say um like are you in a position where people come to you and say oh yeah oh we've got it you don't have to now go oh this is the person that's on my bucket list i would love to work with them and you're just trying to like get a meeting or a phone call to be honest i, I, I kind of reach if, if i want to work with somebody i reach out to them yeah and and touch wood <laughs> with um because <laughs> they of the always answer your call <laughs> yeah they answer my call and because of because of the credibility probably I've, I've built over the years um there's this everyone they they try and entertain it or they do entertain it, yeah. I, and so it's it's a little easy in that aspect, but it's it's difficult because also because now I've I've got um a benchmark, you know what I mean I've got uh, um I've got people there's an expectation from me as well, so um for me I I want to make sure I'm making the right decisions in the songs I'm making as mm -hmm. well, so that's my hustle now. The hustle is is making a great record but keeping it real. Because I've had like phases through these last like seven, eight years where I've I felt like I've fallen off mm -hmm. in terms of um, the music I've been making. And that's simply because, like I was saying about the Bollywood thing as well, because things like um, things that I've done, which I thought felt like it's crushing my soul. But I think now coming out from that it's it's now I'm, I'm just remembering why i started making music because i love mm -hmm. making music like some of the biggest songs i've ever made have, have been made off the back of of me believing in them mm -hmm. like like for example like i remember the song i released last year called Ertavar. um it was so successful for me and um i remember when i was doing my album my last album um the label didn't even believe in that song no one believed in that song but i knew that was going to be the most successful song of the album and there was no even no video for it so physically we we funded the video we made sure we we, we wow. collaborated with b-funk on it the whole uh, concept came from us so we were like you know we want to make this happen and from that boom the song clicked and obviously um b-funk were a massive part of that as well and um it just worked i think that i think that's what it comes down to believing in yourself and believing in your vision and executing that in the way you want to do it as an artist let me ask you how did you know though like, do you just know your fans really well? Or like, I, I, I'm really fascinated by mm. this because I've heard so many people say like, no one believed in a, like a project or mm. a song, but they believed in it. They mm. fund it themselves or they make it on their own, whatever. Mm. And then it becomes a hit. And I'm always mm. like, how did you know? You know what it is? Yeah. I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to put the question at you. Okay. So when you listen to a song, like who do you like listening to? Like, what artists do you like listening oh, to? Oh, like everyone. Like hit, I do Western. Hit. Okay. But r who I really have been digging right now is Jonita Gandhi. Okay, yeah. Jonita Gandhi, for example, right? Yeah. When you listen to her songs and when you hear it for the first time, do you feel something? Like, do you feel mm -hmm. like, you feel like, this is amazing? Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I feel when I make a song. Like, when, when, when you make a song and you listen back to it after it's, it's, it's been completed, if I feel like it's amazing, then I know people, my, my fans and people of music love, that love music are going to connect to it. And that's mm -hmm. exactly how it is. I'm a music fan, right? Before I'm even an artist. I'm a, I'm a, I am a hardcore music fan, and if I make a song that I actually love listening to, I know people are gonna love it as well, mm -hmm. and that's what it is. That's the recipe. I think artists, when artists forget who they are and they start making music for other people, is when they lose themselves. But the way it should be is you should be make mu making music for your own soul and for your own for your own mind, and then from that, people will connect to it. That's how, that's how music is changing people's lives because they connect, like someone like Lauren Hill, mm -hmm. her album Miss Education, it, it changed people's mindset and lives, man. And why was that? It's because it came from the soul, it came from her heart, and people connected with that. And that's the power of, of, of something that you believe in inside yourself, is how it connects with people, man, and resonates. So when you, let's say, work on a song, because yeah. I always love that creative process too. Yeah. Are, do you find you're an artist that gets in, you know, you get inspired, you start writing down the lyrics, you go to the next day, record it, and it's done, or is it quite the long process for you? I have to feel, like, see, there's so many different processes in Punjabi music, right? Yeah. There's I'm picturing you pumping gas, and you're like, ah, oh, 
this lyric. I better start like writing it down. Oh, I gotta get right into the studio and record this. Different ways. Number one, I sit with lyricists and I go through songs with them and we, we work on something together. That's one process. There's another process where I, I sit with someone like Alan, Alan Sampson, my mm -hmm. producer, uh, recently done my last two singles, Giving the Sun Gay Side. He's phenomenal, but um, I don't wanna go into that yet. <laughs> but sitting with him and just just him catching a vibe on, on 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 his keyboard, just right, just maybe putting down some melodies on his keyboard or some chords, and then I'm feeling uh, I'm feeling like yo that that sounds cool, man. I like the sound of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And he'll put down a chord progression, and from that he'll be like, all right, now I've got the idea of how how you feeling, like how do you feel right now? So like give it a song. It was the song I did about three four months ago. That that song in particular was like the process was like yo I'm feeling like this, man. Like I'm I'm feeling this girl, but. I don't know how to say it to her. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's how I'm feeling right now. He's like, all right, cool, man. So let's put down some melodies. I, I put down the melodies for the song and then and then he puts down the beat and then I write to the beat. That's that's one another process as well. But and but there's also the other way as well where I'll be like I'll be somewhere and I'll hear a beat, like, yo, I love this beat, man. Let's try and do a, me hum a melody over it. And I record it on my phone and then when I get into a session I record there's so many different ways. Mm -hmm. There's no set way. I know some people be like Yo, uh, I've got to be in a in a um, in a zen kind of vibe. I've got to be like in a, in a, in my own room, in my own space, mm -hmm. and then write. I I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, I can practice like that, yeah. but I can't write like that. Mm -hmm. I have to be in an environment where I feel inspired. Like sometimes we'll be in the studio for like hours listening to like international music and everything, and then after that we'll come up with something and we'll be inspired. Yo, this is sick. Yo, why don't we make something like this? And like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then from that, boom, chords are put down, beats put down, and it's recorded. Mm -hmm. There's that way. There's so many different ways of making music, man, mm -hmm. for me personally. But I, I can't I can't be inspired by sitting in a room doing nothing. Yeah, that's why I always think it's just interesting how you guys get into that mindset and come up with, like, some beautiful song. I want to actually ask you also about new talent. Yeah. So obviously this weekend you met with a lot of up-and-coming singers. A lot of people went to see you that yeah. are just wanting to be like you, but maybe haven't really stepped into the industry. Yeah. What is it like when new talent is trying to work with you? Yeah. Like, so maybe you have some advice for people. If they're like wanting to work with you, maybe they've got a beat, maybe they write lyrics, yeah. whatever it is. And they're like, oh man, this would be perfect for jazz on me. Like, how do I, like, what is, are you open to that? How is oh, the best yeah, way to approach man. someone like you? There's so many people um, I've worked with just off the back of just Instagram. Like, so if they DM you, you're yeah, actually reading yeah, them and I'm reading them and, and if not my manager's reading them, like some someone will if I'm feeling the vibe, I will get back to them. That's how it works. Cause like I understand the hustle, man. Mm -hmm. Like I don't I don't want to be the artist where I mean I can't respond to everybody, I know that, but I I don't want to be the artist if someone's hitting me up and I'm not getting back to them because mm -hmm. I was there as well, man. You know, I was the artist that no one some people weren't getting back to me. And I, I felt rejected at that point as well. But um I want to be that kind of artist where people uh, feel like I'm approachable and and yeah. I'm I'm open to work with anybody. Like seriously, I don't care how many followers you've got. I don't care how how big you are in the circuit, whatever. Like if I'm feeling your vibe, you 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 you're working with me. That's how it is, man. Seriously. That's how it should be. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so then before I let you go, any last piece of advice you have for people in terms of let's not even do music industry. Let's yeah. just say someone is like you, has a dream, mm. is willing to put in the work and the hustle. What advice do you have for them in pursuing it? I'd say you can't give up simply because like if you've set out to do something and make something happen, that's something that's come from within right mm -hmm. and if if you don't pursue that it's just going to crush your soul and then and you don't want to be in a rocking chair of 20 30 years later and being like you know i wish i did that like seriously you do not want to be that person man if you if you want to be successful in whatever you do you just have to believe in it believe in yourself like self-belief is the biggest thing i know you, you've probably heard it from so many people but believing it within yourself and knowing that you can you can do something is the most important thing and you know what and I think meditating and actually building the foundations of, of whatever you're doing. Like, like for example, like if you're a musician, mm -hmm. you have to understand your music before you get into it. Like, mm -hmm. not, you don't have to, but you have to, you have to have some sort of knowledge. Like, for example, when I was, when I was studying music, at points I was like, why am I even doing this? Like, I can just get up and make a song and be successful. Yeah, you can, but you don't want to be in a position where 
you're in a session or something and you can't understand something. Yeah. I know you can learn that, but if you know it for yourself before you can go into it, into something, at least you'll have the foundation, the basic setup. So I'd say just learn your craft, man, whatever you do. Fantastic. Okay, and so what's coming up for you? What can we look out for? Well, um, I've just dropped acoustic version of a song called Gay Side I've done, mm -hmm, I heard which it. there's so much love for that. Thank you so much, guys. Um, there's a song I've worked uh, on called Bombay, which is going to be coming out uh, later this year. Bombay. Yeah, it's it's really it's produced by a producer called Erin E. He's mm -hmm. done he did some great made some great tracks um, uh, with Imran uh, Amplifier and a lot of the vibes mm -hmm. as well. And in collaboration with um, Alan Sampson, he's produced my last two singles, mm -hmm. and Sam Blake's on the lyrics, man. So it's going to be vibes. And there's so many collaborations happening now, man. Yeah? Yeah, I'm excited for them. Oh, we're excited too. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thank you. Good to have you here. Hopefully not like five years later. <laughs> 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 right? At least we look the same, I yeah. think. Mm -hmm. yeah, we okay. look the same, okay? Why not? <laughs> if you enjoyed my interview, guys, make sure you subscribe and leave a comment. Talk on what I made a name for myself. I can't lie, I'm doing well for my age. My dog said the praying on my downfall. Well, they just choose in the casket, now they souls in the grave. I'm a star right, got a bark right. I induce pain, I am Luke Kane, makes a Bruce Wayne. I'm a dark knight, watch your stargaze. Got a hard bite, I'm a dog at the leash, better talk right. Man, I do this, not a new kid, been a student. You're a doofus, on a real, leave you clueless. When I shoot shit, style too crisp, and I let it all hang out like a nudist. Oh, you want to know?